Shana Tova, everyone. At the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, as the great waves of Jewish immigrants came to the shores of our nation from Eastern Europe by the thousands, including my great-great-grandparents Albert Eber and Rachel, a.k.a. Ray, Gorodetsky, as they came to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Now, that part of Manhattan is one of the hippest neighborhoods, but at that time, it was really transformed into a sort of urban shtetl, if you will. People living in tenements, hawking their wares in the street, filled with the chatter of Yiddish as Jewish peddlers pushed their carts from street to street, trying to sell their tchotchkes, their little trinkets, to feed their families. And between 1880 and 1924, more than two and a half million Eastern European Jews crowded into that Lower East Side. Any of your relatives? Yeah, okay, right? It's a story for many of us, not all of us. Now, as you might expect, new Jewish immigrant families built synagogues to serve their families. And these small communities were often centralized where the families came from in Europe. The Bialystoker synagogue was for the Polish Jews, the Lutwisker Shul for the Lithuanians, or Benjay Jacob Anshe Brezan for those Jews from Southeast Galicia. You get the picture. But while the synagogues differed in their dialects and religious practice, they were more than just a place to pray. They were, for virtually all the men and women of the community at the time, ad hoc community centers. And many of them had the express goal of helping the mostly poor Eastern European Jews, most of whom lived in these tenements that lacked running water or plumbing or electricity, to become American. In fact, it turns out that the synagogues that they went to and the schools that they had, guess what language they taught? Was it Yiddish? Was it Hebrew? Well, there were classes in Hebrew and Yiddish, but most kids spoke those at home, or they learned Hebrew coming to shul every Shabbat morning. The language the religious schools taught? English. It was part of their effort to help families, children especially, make it in America. The Golden of Medina, as Tevya called it in the epic Fiddler on the Roof, the Golden Land. If you've ever been to Temple Sinai in San Francisco, there's a stained glass window of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. And do you know where he's standing? It's not on Mount Sinai, even at Temple Sinai. He's standing on Yosemite. Right? <laughs> That's how much they thought America was a special holy place to be. During those first years of immigration, Jewish people almost exclusively married other Jews or worked in Jewish-owned businesses and lived in Jewish neighborhoods, had Jewish friends, and gave to and were supported almost exclusively by Jewish social service organizations. In part, this is a reflection of the anti-Semitism of that era. Even Jews with advanced degrees or professional careers were not able to get jobs in non-Jewish firms. And while Tevya and Golda's daughter, Seitzel, did marry a non-Jew, it was not a widespread phenomenon, in part because Jews, both by choice and historical circumstance, did not interface with the non-Jewish world socially in the way that we do today. In the early 1960s, synagogues began to trend of moving from cities to the suburbs. Children and grandchildren from those immigrants on the Lower East Side no longer spoke Yiddish, but English. Yes, they still lived in Jewish enclaves, but colleges and universities were beginning to open to us. Jewish life was still centered in the home and synagogues created the supplemental religious school model that we have today, often two or three afternoons each week in addition to Shabbat morning and Sunday morning, where Jewish kids went to religious school to learn Hebrew and Jewish text. How many of you were three day a weekers or more? Oh boy, right? Okay, right? So it used to be, this is a common experience for many who went. And they went to learn Hebrew and Jewish text and history and tradition and prayer and holidays, much like we do today. But the synagogues created these schools to supplement what was happening at home, not to replace it. 
By the 90s, the first comprehensive Jewish population study showed that the intermarriage rate of the Jewish community had jumped to 52% nationally. By 2013, the Pew study reported that it was at 71% for non-Orthodox Jews. Now, in case you're concerned that I find this problematic, let me assure you, I do not. I am describing historical trends. And personally, I have officiated at multiple weddings. Half of them have been between a Jew and a non-Jew. And here at CBS, we know that a large segment of the students in our religious school and in our community have a non-Jewish parent or non-Jewish grandparents or other family members. Let me be really clear. This is amazing. That non-Jewish parents are here and supportive of their children being raised to Jews as Jews is to me miraculous and a blessing. And that this change occurred in only a few generations, I wish that my grandparents could be alive to see it. As I said at another point, some of us are B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, but all of us who are members and work our hands in this community can be B'nai Yisrael, the builders of the Jewish people. But here's the thing. The parental drop-off structure of religious education for our children still operates much like it did when the model was created for my parents in the 1950s and makes many of the same assumptions about who Jewish families are. Two Jewish parents who were themselves both raised in Jewish households, who observe Shabbat and keep kosher, and they work and they have many Jewish friends and they work in a Jewish business and Judaism is the center of their life. And that's just not who the vast majority of our community is today. Now, in some ways, I could be disappointed, right? And say that I wish this was the center of everyone's life, but it's not, right? And we hope that CBS can be one of the three or four communities of meaning in your life. But because of this gap between the way we used to teach and who we are, it's important that we rededicate ourselves to rethinking, reinventing, reimagining for all of us, not just our kids, the importance of Jewish education. Let me highlight an example, and I'll name that some of our parents have heard this before, but it bears repeating that for many years at my previous congregation, the kindergartners made a Shabbat box. Students created and decorated the Shabbat shoebox. They made their own kiddush cup, a challah cover and candlesticks, a, a really cute project. And they would take it home with instructions to the families to try Shabbat at home. A few years ago, a non-Jewish dad came to me holding his daughter's Shabbat box, Shabbat box and he said to me a little choked up, Rabbi, I I'm not Jewish. We've been here for Tat Shabbat for the first Shabbat of the month since our kid was three year old, years old. I'm committed to raising them as Jews, but we do Shabbat here. And that even with this sheet, the blessings, they don't roll off my tongue. I, I just, I don't know how to do this at home. He wasn't angry, but the message was clear. He needed his synagogue to support him and his family to live a Jewish life. The assumptions of who our families are and what they know or what they have experienced with Judaism or how they grew up don't work today like they did for my parents' generation or even for mine. There's a disconnect between who we are, the assumptions we've made about our community, and the structure of our education. So why am I sharing this with you today? Because here at CBS, we have begun an effort to transform education. We're asking some big questions. What are the core Jewish values that animate Jewish living and learning here at Beth Shalom? What are the goals and practices in our educational program? How will the structure support our families and students and our values as CBS moves forward? Right? And how do we integrate all of who we are and who we hope to become from education to worship to tikkun olam to Hebrew to caring for one another? I'm sharing this with you today because redreaming and transforming our Jewish education to meet our families and students of today is a big, bold initiative, and we want multiple voices to co-create this new venture with us. 
We have formed an educational redesign committee that is undertaking the sacred task of exploring these questions. And in our religious school, this looks like many of the new initiatives that we're undertaking this year. One example is about the importance of learning Hebrew, not just for learning prayers, but for common what we call Jewish life vocabulary. Basic Hebrew phrases, like when we tell someone yashir koach, meaning nice job, or mazal tov, mazal tov, congratulations. Hebrew is the sacred and special language, aka lingo, of the Jewish people. And knowing the basics of Hebrew can be a key that helps unlock feeling more at home in our prayers and in our community. And we are excited to be an innovative congregation willing to try these new approaches. In religious school, that means getting personalized Hebrew instruction now for kids in fourth through seventh grade once they're ready to learn Hebrew and begin learning their B'nai Mitzvah prayers more intensively. And speaking of tefillot, prayer time, that happens every week so that students of all ages are hearing and singing the prayers, which is vital for feeling comfortable. We're also doing Hebrew through movement, an immersive Simon Says-like pedagogy to learn Hebrew commands by moving our bodies. We're creating a sound, rich environment and using Jewish life vocabulary so that every person in our religious school at every age is learning Hebrew in developmentally appropriate ways. Reimagining Jewish education means a renewed emphasis on Jewish values and how when we teach any text or prayer that we're exploring it through the lens of how is it relevant to the life of the student. How when we learn a Jewish story or prayer are we emphasizing how it's connected to a value in their lives. We're not merely teaching and learning about what happens in the story of Noah's Ark, but exploring how is that story important in my life today. We have a lot of work to do. We have some of the answers, but we don't have all of them yet, and we're living into the questions, letting them animate our work and inspire our vision. We believe that Beth Shalom has a powerful opportunity together to create the next generation of courageous, loving Jews. And we are blessed. We are blessed to have an amazing faculty of religious school teachers who are on this journey with us, all of whom are parents or members of the community. For little pay or volunteer time, they give their time and their hearts each week to teach the beauty of Judaism to your children and theirs, and we are blessed to have each one of them. Thank you. Thank you to our teachers for your dedication and commitment to our children and the school. I would also be remiss not to mention Wendy Adler, Zikrona Livracha, may her memory be a blessing. Wendy, our former school education director who we lost tragically this year, too soon. Her legacy that she left this school is so important, one of care for each child and her heart for Jewish wisdom. But not just our children, but you adults, have many opportunities as well to dip your toe into Jewish learning for the first time or to advance your knowledge in other ways. We have an amazing group of students who learn every Thursday at 11.30 a.m. in person or via Zoom. We have Torah study every Shabbat at 9, also accessible via Zoom. We have adult Hebrew classes, pre-high holiday classes, a conversion course. In February, I'm going to be offering a Judaism 101 slash refresher course entitled something like Jewish education for anyone whose education ended in seventh grade or who is now more mature and different than you were when you were 13. <laughs> we're working on the brand. <laughs> we will also, after the high holidays, be sharing a list of parent classes and opportunities for Jewish learning during religious school to help parents have meaningful opportunities to learn and be in community together. We have lay-led book groups, lay-led adult Hebrew classes, Right? There are so many ways for each of you to take a step further in your Jewish learning. I've been so blessed this year to teach a, a cohort of many conversion students, uh, nine students. And something that inspires me about our conversion students is their desire to care about Judaism. Many of us take it for granted. We're just Jews, we show up, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, and that's okay. But may we be inspired by our converts 
and their fresh eyes for Jewish learning and their hearts for taking that step further on their journey into our community. Each of us has something to learn and to teach. Pirkei Avot says, Ezehu Chacham, who is wise? Mi shelomeid mi kol adam, one who learns from everyone. So a hundred years ago, Ray and Albert were born in the Pale of Settlement, and they came through Ellis Island and they spoke Yiddish, and they lived in a tenement on the Lower East Side and had a tight-knit, complicated, rich, thick Jewish community and synagogue life. But today, Ray and Albert might be adopted, might be African-American, could have a parent who was born Jewish, and might have a parent who converted to Judaism, or maybe a parent who's supportive of raising a Jewish kid, but practices a different religious tradition altogether, or none at all. They could have two mommies or two daddies. We owe the Rays and Alberts and their great-grandchildren and their great-grandparents a community and a Jewish education that speaks to their deepest spiritual longings, their boldest dreams, and the truths of who they and their families were, are, and are becoming. So what a blessing it is in 5785 that they are a part of Congregation Beth Shalom and that we have the privilege of learning and growing with them. Shana Tovah.